Hello and welcome to the Sovereign Collective Podcast, where we bring you real raw truths for your self-empowerment. I'm your host, Sasha Calavota, and I believe that you can stand on your own two feet, but that you don't have to do it alone. I love learning from people who continually strive to raise the bar, to go against mainstream thinking, and who dare to question the general consensus. People are risking ridiculed or even risk the loss of their professional status as they bravely question the common narratives and challenge the rest of us to expand our minds and to reconsider what we think we already know. Join me in learning how to take control of your health and your mind so that you can have the energy to think more clearly and the confidence to step up and take responsibility for all aspects of your life. We promise to never censor here because I believe you are strong enough to hear the real raw truth to make up your own mind. If you like what you find here at the Sovereign Collective Podcast, then please share with your friends and family. I so appreciate you. Thank you for tuning in. And now on to the show. Hi, y'all. This is Sasha here for two quick announcements before we get on to our interview for today. First of all, if you are looking for quality supplements, quality tonic herbs, some specialty food items, and you're in and around Calgary, then please go check out Lotus Herbal Health, a great family-run store that has two locations in Calgary. You can find them at lotusherbalhealth.ca to find out where their locations are, or you can shop online and they will pretty much deliver anywhere. So quality supplements, tonic herbs, great staff, check out lotusherbalhealth.ca. Secondly, I want to announce the relaunch of my program called Your Conscious Pregnancy and Parenting Guide, which consists of experts in their fields around the world on consciousness and parenting and education and nutrition and dentistry and homeopathy and more. This is a program I created after my son was born about 10 years ago, a little bit more than that. And I am now very concerned after the events of 2020 for our future generations. And I believe the time is now for conscious parenting and for conscious parents to rise up and to take, to take back our pregnancies and our births and our parenting and the resilience of our children and of future generations. The time is now. We change the course of history by changing the course of our future generations. And we do that by consciously raising them, consciously birthing them, consciously conceiving them, feeding them good food, and taking back the responsibility of raising healthy, well-adjusted, robust people. Resilience. It's time to build resilience. So please go check out sovereigncollective.org forward slash get the guide, and you will be able to check out all of the amazing material in there. It's time for us to understand how our worldviews are formed, how our self-views are formed, and how to impact that and how that impacts the society on a whole. So check it out, sovereigncollective.org forward slash get the guide. And now on to the show. Hey everyone, it's Sacha here with another interview for the Sovereign Collective podcast with another really important topic. One that I've touched before in my earlier interview with Janice Barcelo, and also something that I have covered in my program on conscious pregnancy and parenting, which if if you go to the store page, you will see the link to go there and check it out. And I'm going to give this a shameless plug right now because that program I created after I had my son when I realized there were some really big issues that are affecting the ability as of a person to become well-adjusted, robust, emotionally, physically. And the topic that we are covering today with my guest here, Harry Gearmond, is on circumcision. Circumcision, the idea of thinking that our baby boys are somehow imperfect and need to be adjusted in their most sensitive time of life when they come into this life new and trusting and needing our nurturing and our love and our protection. And instead, so many parents give them over to this very harmful procedure. So I have addressed that in my program on conscious pregnancy and parenting, along with so many other things. And this is a really key issue because when I was doing an interview with Elena in the program, Elena Tonetti Vladimirova, who I've interviewed a couple of times for this podcast on other things, uh, you know, she, she told us it's a time when often men check out emotionally right from the beginning and aren't able to connect to their emotional because that's, that's a a protection mechanism, right? So anyways, we're going to get into that more. I know Harry's going to have a ton of things to, to enlighten us on. And for some, this might be a hard topic, whether you are a man and you know that something isn't right because you've had a very vital piece of your anatomy removed, 
or because you're a parent and maybe you have done this. I remember talking to a mother and I was talking about circumcision and she said, I did that for my son. And I said, you did it for your son? Oh, I, I, I don't think you understand what I'm trying to say about it. It's not exactly for, I would say it's more like two, unfortunately. So anyways, thank you, Harry, so much for being with me today. I really look forward to getting into the gritty details of circumcision and what everybody needs to know. Well, thank you, Sasha. This is a great introduction and you, you definitely understand the, the, the issue. Um, it is harmful, traumatic, damaging, and there's absolutely no reason to mutilate a newborn child of either gender. Right. So, and, uh, and female circumcision or female genital mutilation is illegal in the most of the civilized world, including the United States and Canada. But there is this glaring blind spot that uh, boys are just as vulnerable as girls at that age. They're not tough guys. They're not big, strong men. They are helpless, helpless, needing, desperately needy people. Infants just are need. And they need love and nurturing and touch and kindness and gentleness and to cut their most intimate body part with a knife, that's the greeting into the world, is a, is a monstrosity. It's just beyond words. It's, if you could, it would be hard to imagine anything worse. I, I think uh, Christopher Hitchens said it would be difficult to imagine uh, anything more grotesque than the uh, mutilation of infant genitalia. Uh, and he's right. I, you know, he, he was presenting it in the context of atheism and the problem with religion, but he's absolutely right. In any context, a baby should not undergo that kind of trauma. It just, there is no justification for it. Right. And you, before we get into, I, I didn't even introduce you at all. So you are with the organization Bloodstained Men. I know from an interview that I watched with you just a little while ago that you underwent circumcision as a child yourself and you're a retired engineer, I believe. That's yes? right. Yes. And so now you, you know, like somehow you have been led to come to work with this organization, which is very active, right? right. So, so what is it in you before we get into other details about it, what is it in you that actually led to actually spending your time this way for this cause? Um, I, around the age of 16, I realized that um, part of my penis had been cut off. And, uh, you know, I grew up in a fairly um, liberal-minded household and, and, and we had uh, respect for, you don't torture animals, you don't, uh, you're not cruel to people, you're not rude, you don't go out of your way to harm anybody. I mean, all those values that I understood and was were, were deeply inculcated into me, all the values which I cheer, still cherish, well, circumcision, what happened to my body just made no sense in terms of the values that I was taught. And I was just, I was dumbfounded that my parents could have allowed such a thing um, and that there was no respect for me as a human being. And that something that had to be traumatic was, was intentionally inflicted on me without any need. And that at the time, I, you know, I wanted to know the reasons and, and the reasons were obvious lies. I mean, it, you didn't have to be a genius to figure this out. This is just, th these justifications make no sense. So Wait, I was what, outraged. What were the justifications? What, how do, what it's cleaner. Mm -hmm. it's cleaner. You don't get as many diseases, they say. Well, it's cleaner. Yeah, your mouth would be cleaner if somebody tore out all your teeth. But then you wouldn't have teeth. And it would be an assault. And anybody in their right mind would know that that's a crime. It's a violent assault on a helpless person. You, it's, that is not a justification. And of course, as you know, and we all know that the, the, the biome of the body, there's germs, bacteria everywhere, and they're healthy. They're necessary for our, our, our functioning healthy life. The idea that somehow it, it's cleaner is just insane, as all of the, the, the ideas are. Uh, 
it, it obviously doesn't pre prevent disease. Actually, there was just a new paper out from Denmark that's showing that um, uh, sexually transmitted disease among circumcised men was higher than... Mm. Mm -hmm. So it's um, these are justifications. These are excuses to continue um, a barbaric and monstrous and highly profitable business. So I have some ideas why they would continue doing that. But if the science knows, if we clearly let's let's be clear, there's scientism, and then there's science. So if this science clearly shows that there are no benefits, I know many medical organ. I don't know if any medical organization or governing body around the world actually deems it a necessary act. And um, no, not necessary. But the American Academy of Pediatri Pediatrics in 2012 produced a very um, underhanded and deceitful and biased uh, report which said, uh, we don't know what the risks are, but the risks, but the benefits outweigh the risks, which is mm -hmm. incoherent to begin with. And right. uh, it was, and it was criticized by uh, uh, an association of pediatricians from Canada and all over Europe, basically the leading pediatricians, the, the head of the pedia the National Pediatrics Associations in 38 countries all criticized and found this this uh, presentation by or this report by the American Academy of Pediatrics to be biased and unscientific. And their conclusions are, we can't say that it's actually good for a boy because of course they could be sued if they said that. But they in a very underhanded way said they believe the benefits outweighed the risks. When they were confronted on that, they, they finally just said they have a feeling that the benefits outweigh the risk. It's just nonsense. That's not science. It's not about feelings. They're not scientists. But even though it was refuted by 38 highly respected pediatricians from leading uh, developed, sophisticated countries, the AP never backed off, never retracted it. And, uh, and the, the conclusion of the paper is that it should be covered by insurance. Well, now you get to the root of it. The American Academy of Pediatrics, if you look at their mission statement, their mission statement is all about benefiting doctors. It has zero, they have zero mission for benefiting patients. So it's a union, it's a trade union, and their mission is to make sure the money keeps flowing into doc doctors' pockets. That's their mission. And so they want the insurance money to keep coming. And I believe also they're afraid, they know that, what, that, that there's a huge liability here and they wanna give cover for their uh, perpetrators. And that's what I'll call them mm -hmm. uh, for uh, the, the liability that, they've, that, they've, that they have. It's not like it's a theoretical liability. They've done this damage. They are liable to, for, if you just think of the number of victims and a, what, liabilities are settled for in the United States for un unnecessary amputations, you know, it's in the hundreds of billions of dollars. That's what they owe already. The, the, what, what, what percentage of the, the American population is circumcised, would you say? And, and, what, um, and how, how, and is that current? Like, is that still happening? At yeah. That? So it's, the numbers are hard to pin down, but um, it seems to be um, more than 50% of boys are still being cut in the United States. More than 50? More than 50. Wow. I didn't think it was yeah. that hard. Yeah. It's my, it, it, it's, and parents are often pressured. Oh, do you want to come today or tomorrow? You know, it's like they're pressured. And, oh, just sign this and we'll get the little snip done mm. as if it was nothing. And it's a traumatic mutilation, amputation, uh, unnecessary surgery, which is completely um, against medical ethics to be doing unnecessary surgery on a non-consenting person. That's absolutely unethical from the start. Yeah. So they are selling it uh, at warp speed and they will latch on to whatever 
obsolete paper that they can find or biased paper that they can find. Well, it's it's cleaner. It's the, the benefits outweigh the risk. Look at the AP, look what they said. They will do that time and time again. They will not look at uh, that these things have already been refuted and they, they don't care because it's just a money machine. It's you're, you're just talking to a cash register when you're talking to an American uh, nurse trying to sell you circumcision. Mm -hmm. And how do those numbers compare to other countries around? Like I'm in Canada. I don't even know what the rate of circumcision here. I, we tend to follow similarly. Yes, Canada is ahead of the United States and the Canadian Pediatric uh, Association uh, uh, declined to go along with the AAP when the AAP made their statement. They, they made a not strong enough statement against circumcision, but they did not recommend it. So that was good. They they decided that you know we're not going to follow American insanity here. We we have sovereignty. You know we're mm. Canadians. We don't do these stupid things. Wow. So good for Canada. And the the number I generally hear about Canada is that overall it's about thirty percent, which is shockingly high. And the maritime provinces uh, had always resisted circumcision, so it's never been done much there. Interesting. And. BC had done it a lot, but then in the around the year 2000, they the provincial health plan stopped paying for it, and the the number of circumcisions fell dramatically. Uh -huh. yeah. And I believe it's also in the case with the United States, the Midwestern area is the highest uh, cutting area. So probably you know Saskatchewan and uh, is and. Uh, and Manitoba and would be higher than um, than Alberta, mm -hmm. but I, I don't have the you know it, it's very hard to get these exact numbers and so right. but right. I think I can safely say thirty percent is probably right, right overall for right. Canada. Right. Okay. And I'm just wondering. I I feel like our children are very much targeted these days on many 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 levels, and I feel like. Do you think there could be another reason to want like? There's the money, but they've got to know what's causing harm. Not just that they're making, it's not like, oops, we'll just throw that away and no harm done to you. I mean, they get their money, but there's lasting effects on the individual. Right. So right. I, 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 do you feel that there are other ulterior motives to continuing this practice, knowing in fact that it is harmful? Well, there are some people who feel they're defending their ethnic group by defending circumcision. So Muslims and Jews feel that uh, that they have that they're defending their group identity. I mean, not all of them, some of them. They're, some of the strongest voices against circumcision are Jews and Jewish doctors and mm -hmm. Jewish psychiatrists and Jewish professionals. They have thought about this for a long time and uh, and a lot of the great books uh, opposing circumcision were written by Jewish authors. So it's not like it, it's always you can't lump everybody together. But for some people in an ethnic community, they believe this is uh, a mark of identification that um, any uh, criticism of is a criticism of their community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, right. That's the thing. People take everything so personally. It's not about you. <laughs> Let's look at the truth. It's not about you. Right. Uh, right. So, so, yeah. I, just we're, so we're apes. We're, we are um, uh, tribal apes, and we are hardwired to see everything in terms of tribal conflict. Mm. So when everything, when it, it's the first thing that happens when you say anything, people translate it into an us versus them oh, yeah. discussion. And in order to have a, a discussion that's fruit, fruitful, you have to say, well, this is not about tribalism. You know, this is about human rights for everyone. Absolutely. And uh, we are not here to uh, create hate. That's not our job. Right. I, I, and I'm sure it would actually lead to a much more peaceful, loving society if all men were actually intact and this act of violence wasn't inflicted upon them within the first days of their lives. Yeah, I, I, I have no doubt about that. And, you know, in, in Australia, they used to cut boys about 40 years ago, they stopped and uh, their health improved. So this this idea that health would be, you know, the, the circumcision advocates in Australia at the time were saying, oh, health will be destroyed if we don't do circumcision. Whoa, no, no, no. Well, their health improved. So, uh, you know, there, there you have it. And 
I believe their psychological health uh, proves, improves. Yes, I, I, I'm sure, absolutely. So what, what is the history of circumcision? Where did, what, what is the actual true origin story around circumcision? Um, I don't think anybody really knows. I mean, we know that the Egyptians marked their slaves by cutting off the foreskin of the men. And at that time, Jews uh, were slaves in Egypt and they were cut. And it's believed by some, everything about all these stories are, are disputed. So, I mean, in history is everybody tells the story differently, but it's believed by some that for some reason after this practice uh, was imposed on them after they left Egypt, um, they imposed it upon themselves. And uh, this actually is not that surprising that whenever there's a, a change in uh, the, the social control, the new, the new leaders adopt the methods of the old leaders. So mm. in, in, in uh, Jamaica, under British rules, uh, the blacks were whipped to keep them in line. When the blacks got independent, whipping should have stopped, but no, that's how they kept kept social order. So the whipping continued. But now instead of white people whipping black people, it was black people whipping black people. Wow. So the new order adopts the techniques of the old order. And perhaps uh, after leaving Egypt, uh, they adopted the, you know, this practice of circumcision. But, you know, all these things are disputed. I, I It's all, you know, it's somewhat... It's, it's cloudy. I mean, it's a long time ago. None of us are firsthand witnesses to right. things that happened thousands of years ago. So we're right. all depending on, on people who wrote at a time when did, people didn't have the same standards of accuracy for history. So, you know, there were mythology and history and, you know, and actual events were all mixed up together. And, and so whenever you try to go back to sort out what really happened, you've got quite a job to do. But, you know, historians are glad to do that and they do the best they can but it's always a reconstruction so the 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 short answer is we don't know for sure right right and and you say the standards of accuracy and i think what i'm really realizing these past couple of years more than ever before so standards of accuracy i don't know how how strict they are even to this day i mean i think that the history is told by those who want to uh share their version of history, shall we say. Yep. I, I think that's something more and more I'm questioning everything I've ever learned about anything. <laughs> so is it true that once upon a time, though, rather than removing the whole foreskin, it was just a slit to draw a little bit of blood? Is there, I, I've heard this story before. I don't know if that's actually true or is there different kinds? Of They're different types. So I, I think in the Pacific Islands, they did this uh, slit type thing uh, cut. And uh, the original, uh, the original Jewish cut was uh, only the overhanging part uh, beyond the glands was cut, which is still very damaging, but less damaging than cutting off the whole foreskin. Because the, there's actually a muscle that draws the uh, the foreskin closed over the glands uh, to keep it to keep it warm and you know when it's cold and to keep it protected. So um, it it's you're losing a lot of sensitivity and this muscle and and blood vessels. I mean when you cut any part of it off, so it's always damaging. But it became more damaging when they went to a more radical cut later on. And okay, so. And there's this other other form so let I what, what I want to talk about is how it is done and then if we could talk about why we don't want to do it what are we cutting off and throwing away or maybe not throwing away maybe it's being used for other things I don't even know in this crazy world but oh it is uh yeah we could talk about that too if you want to share like it's just nasty this ugh. but because I know from my talk with Elena with my talks with her that often there's no anesthetic being used, but not only, I was also um, looking at pictures of rabbis chewing it off of babies. 
like, and I actually saw like, and I'm like, if this isn't a satanic pedophilic ritual, I don't know what is. Like, I, 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 how could any aware parent that like where you are like for me when I, my son was born like literally my 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 first thought was like this baby could kill someone and I would still them like my drive to protect him and care for him and nurture him was stronger than anything I ever felt like there's no way I would have given him up to any kind of any other authority there's there's yeah. just no way and to think that I could think of strapping him to a board to do something like that is just I I don't understand that so I don't understand how people could and I, and I, I tell people if you're going to do that to your son then you should be in there in, in the room and watching to see what's going on with with your baby because Elena I think I think I I think I told you in the email or something but she had to go through something like seven editor editors to actually fully edit that scene they couldn't handle watching it and this is what we're submitting our most vulnerable people humans to in the beginning of their life so how is this performed and what what is that baby going through in that process? Yeah, uh, first of all, I don't think they, they, in the Jewish ritual, I don't think they chew it off, but they, in some uh, Orthodox sex, they, they suck the blood, which is already horrible. Okay. But well, uh, they cut it, but then they suck the blood. And then oh, boys okay. have died and suffered severe brain injury from uh, herpes infections that they got from the, the Jewish moil who... Mm. who's put his mouth on the bloody penis and uh in new york they were trying to do something about this but the new york health department did just rolled over and played dead did nothing oh so and this is this is what we see all the time they just it's just... still happening they are still sucking the blood of i believe so because the the so what the new york health department finally did they have to yeah the parents have to sign a form that says we understand this will happen Wow. And that's all. That's the only protection wow. the boy gets. So it's basically like saying it's signing a form that's saying, you know, this boy and my boy has an excuse to be, we're giving him an excuse. We're signing a form to excuse him from life wow. because uh, he may die from this and he may be severely brain injured from it. So, and nobody's held accountable for that. None. Nope. Not at all. Not at all. Unbelievable. Okay, so in other processes, how is this done generally in the hospital? So um, uh, the the story about anesthetic varies, and that this there is uh, there's uh, they don't they're not required to use anesthetic. They can they can torture the boy all they want. They can cut off as much as they want. It's like they're they're free to do whatever the hell they want to this helpless child. Uh, you know, just go ahead, have at it, have your fun. Uh, do whatever sadistic thing you want to do because uh, no, we're not going to help this boy. So they have uh, something called Emla cream, which is a, um, a topical anesthesia, which they rub on and then start cutting. But uh, they don't wait long enough for it to take effect often because you know, it's it's all driven by profit in the United States. So time is money, and waiting for this anesthetic to take effect is lost money. And who, who gives a damn about the child, right? It's not our problem if he's suffering. He's not going to sue us. He's too small. He's not going to, uh, you know, he can't talk. He can't, he can't tell his parents what happened to him. So who cares? So that's one way. And the manufacturer of Emla cream said this should not be used for circumcisions, but they were using it anyway. Oh, really? Um, yeah. And then the other thing is a penile block, which they do a, uh, uh, an injection of uh, anesthetic into the nerve, and it's supposed to completely deaden it. But uh, apparently that doesn't always uh, work, as, as many people who've had dental uh, work has found out that, the, you know, the, the anesthetic didn't, wasn't sufficient to cover, uh, you know, the, the pain that was, that the dental uh, drilling caused. And, but, a, but an adult can say, well, wait, 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 you know, this, yeah. the, I'm feeling something now. Stop, give me another shot. But yeah. the, the boy, the boy can't, he's, he's helpless. He's just, he's just a victim. So they can cause as much pain or damage as they want. They have a free license. The boy has no rights. He's a, he, the girl, if he were a girl, he would have rights. He would, he would be protected by federal law, but if he's a boy, he's not, which is tragic. Strapped into what can you explain the contraption that they use? 
it's called a circumstraint and it's uh, a board with the in, with an indented pattern of a baby's body with uh, with velcro straps that go around the arms and legs so that the boy is immobilized and uh, just think about it you have to strap down your baby to torture him of course you do right. of course you do he'd fight back if he could he would he would do whatever he could to def try to defend himself from being attacked Mm -hmm. So they immobilize him so he can't do whatever primitive, pathetic little defense that he's got. I mean, it's just if if you don't have a heart and it's not breaking, you know, if your heart isn't breaking now, you don't have a heart. I mean, this is this is absolutely heartbreaking. Yes. And and you know, part of the problem for intactivists is that we have to, you know, talk about this terrible thing and show pictures to people of these terrible things, and it's just it's really. Um, you know, it's really hard to deal with child abuse. It's really hard to deal with a, a callous, unfeeling system that looks at their profit and doesn't give a damn what harm they do if the person can't, can't mount a, a, an effective defense. It's, that's, that's where we are. And it's really shocking, the ignorance around it. I was looking at the, like, Brother K's. So Brother K is the founder of Bloodstained Men, right? Yes. And I was looking at his page and just some of the, the shares of people's just completely ignorant comments around, oh, it doesn't matter how expensive it was, we're going to get rid of that turtleneck, you know, just like these just completely idiotic statements around and joking about this torture, like the, 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 the cost of it or the pain or the just like getting rid of this extra silly piece of skin like is shocking. So, so what is the work of bloodstained men all about and how do you, what do you guys do? Well, our job is, I mean, our, our, the, the role that we've taken on is to do public protests on street corners and, and on college campuses and at to medical conventions. To, to say, you know, we're not happy that we were cut. We are, we are not, we're not your satisfied customer. We're mad as hell. Yeah. And uh, you should be aware uh, that this is a problem. And, and we, we especially like to reach young people. Uh, college campuses are great because they're open-minded still and they haven't had kids yet mostly. And yes. uh, they, can make a, they can make a good choice. They were, you know, we're helping, giving them the information to make the right choice because they won't, they're, they, they might get it from their doctor. Some doctors are very enlightened. There's a group called Doctors Opposing Circumcision operating out of Seattle. Yes. And uh, they have a great website, doctorsopposingcircumcision.org. And they do uh, great work. They're professionals. They, you know, whereas we are not doctors, you know, we, we don't give medical advice. We, we can't do that. And we, but we can tell uh, people about the harm we've suffered and that this harm and trauma and loss should not be imposed on anyone else. Right, and I know sometimes it's not just a matter of, uh, like you were saying, there doesn't seem to be any regulations around what they're actually doing. So I know for some, it results in very painful erections. And I, there was a, I, I was on somebody else's podcast a while back and he actually used to, or I don't know if he still does, does naked male yoga. He's an interesting guy. And he said he's seen some pretty botched penises due to circumcision with like actual, not just foreskin missing, but actual, the top of a piece. Like how, how common are these botched jobs? Like, I, and I've even read very unfortunate stories of deaths, right? On, on right. Kids people. die, kids die. We don't know how many die, but because those numbers aren't being published, of course, of course, if you're committing a crime, you don't, right. uh, you cover your tracks, you don't let people know about the crime you're committing. Right. So those numbers, nobody, we don't have access to those numbers, and we should. Right. But various people have tried to estimate the numbers and the, the numbers based on estimations are in the one to 200 in the US per year die. And we know that we know of some that die directly because the, the, the parent, the mother or the father is grieving and they post it, make a post on Facebook or right. about how they lost their son. Mm -hmm. and how devastated they are and so they can't they can't completely silence the truth it gets out there of course um but um we should know uh the effects of circumcision we should know how many violent criminals what percentage of them are circumcised 
I mean, we should know that. If you're, if you know, America has this problem of these mass shootings. America does the most mutilation of boys, and the mass shooters are almost always male. And uh, this only happens in America. Why? Why? What is it about America that's unique that the men are mutilated and they're and they're shooting up schools and shopping centers and places of work? You know, why are they doing that? Because right. something went wrong early in their life. Is my guess. Yeah, as Lena says, it's I think the first time that sex and violence meet. Right. right. Like, exactly. You are you're you're meant to be with a a nurturing female, like a mother figure. And there's this nurse, oh, could you cool, maybe like playing with you a little bit to get you all excited and then. Yeah, because they, they do stimulate an erection more. in order to cut. They they So yeah, they actually stimulate an erection before they start cutting. And then they jab a probe because the, the foreskin is fused to the to the gland, the head of the penis when the baby's born and, and it gradually separates over hit the course of his early life over years. Yes. Years. And each boy is different, but yeah. So it could, it could not fully separate until he's 12, which is fine. Yes. It's natural process. No, nothing to worry about. Yeah. But uh, so in order to uh, separate it, it's very painful. They jab this probe in there. And uh, interestingly, the definition of rape is penetration by a body part or a foreign object. And so at the time that this probe is jammed into the foreskin, that actually technically meets the definition of rape. So the boy is raped with the probe. And then, uh, so this is extremely painful. And then they uh, use some, a, a clamp of some sort and then use, uh, which causes, puts tremendous pressure in, uh, and, uh, seals uh, the blood vessels and then they cut around it it's just monstrous it's it's just something that uh you know something a torture from the middle ages that's still with us it's it's just monstrous well and i know it's been compared to like separating the fingernail from the nail bed but right. forcing that retraction like that with that right yeah and right. we always and and then we have this excuse that we have to circumcise our boys, even if they didn't get circumcised later on, because it's not retracting because it's they're six or seven or eight years old. And it's not retracting when, if we would understand anything about the anatomy of our boys, that that is a completely normal, exactly. healthy penis. Yeah. And that's, that's what it right. is. Do. So if they haven't collected their $300 or whatever it is for the circumcision, when the boy was born, oftentimes, not always, oftentimes at a well baby business a well baby visit right business. Doctor, nurse, <laughs> i like that little slip of the tongue there well baby yeah. visit yeah mm -hmm. will forcibly retract in the in this when the, when they're supposed to be checking out for wellness and they make it and the, it's a, what they call an iatrogenic injury it's a doctor caused injury then it's reddened and uh disturbed and they say oh well look it's, you should have cut him when he was born. Now we'll cut him for you. He needs to be cut. And then they get their money then. And the boy loses his foreskin. Right. And this is another crime. Uh, the doctors opposing circumcision are quite active about informing people about uh, forced retraction in medical settings. Mm -hmm. Nobody should be forcing a boy's penis or foreskin back. Not a parent, not a doctor, not a nurse, nobody. It's, it's his body. And it will naturally... Uh, grow and develop the way it's supposed to if you just leave it alone right right so let's talk about the importance of the foreskin so never mind okay like on top not never mind but on top of pure torture and just a monstrous procedure that we're submitting our boys to what is the function of that foreskin and why like it's there for a reason, clearly. We don't have any excess things that aren't there for a reason, even our appendix. Why is it such an important anatomical structure? Yeah, yeah, there are no extra body parts. With, yeah, it's not extra skin. It's, it's an organ of sensation. It's, it's the most richly endowed part of the male body in terms of uh, nerve, nerve endings. So the most of the sensitivity of the of the penis is in the foreskin. If you if a if a man loses his his foreskin, he loses 
most of his sexual sensitivity, most of his capacity to feel sexual pleasure. Not only that, it's a rolling uh, mechanism, so it makes sex easier. It's a sort of a natural lubricant. The foreskin glides back on entry and glides forward again on exit. So that helps keep the necessary uh, liquids uh, in place during sex. And um, it's pleasurable for both partners. And so beneficial uh, for both male and female in that regard. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, rough sex is, you know, is a problem when the, when the man can't feel anything, he's more likely to be engaging in rough sex and that hurts the woman. And, you know, everybody loses. Mm -hmm. Nobody wins by mutilating children. It's just, it's just everybody loses. Right. And so um, it, it's there for a reason. It has uh, blood vessels, muscles, most of the sexual sensitivity. It keeps the glands, the head of the penis, moist as it's supposed to be moist, the way an eyeball is supposed to be moist. It keeps it covered in moist. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, when that dries out, it loses sensitivity and becomes the skin becomes thicker and loses its sensitivity. If you can, uh, unfortunately, the, the trouble with this topic is that it's hard. You can't show the pictures on TV about you know. But if you should see side by side a picture of a, a, a the glands of an adult man who's been cut versus one who was not cut, and they you know one just looks dried out and old and. You know, you just say, well, the other one looks so much healthier. Why, why would you want to force this on your child? Because it's obviously worse. I mean, you just have to look at it and say, well, yeah, that doesn't look good. Uh, but, you know, the trouble with talking about sex is, and, and, and penises is that, you know, is you, you run, a, you run a foul of people's sense of uh, uh, propriety. But, you know, we do our best. Right. Well, it's something that needs to be discussed. And Janice Barcelo, in my interview with her, she actually did show, we brought her, she brought it up on the screen, a picture of an intact penis and one, and just comparing the glands. One was very delicate and moist and no lines, no texture. And the other one was very different looking and you can see texturized and, and not nearly as, I don't, innocent, I find. It's like it hadn't been exposed like the other one had when you're constantly yeah. exposing it because it's supposed to be covered up most of the time, right? When yeah. you're not using I mean, it. <laughs> nature did not make a mistake when it when she designed the penis. She did not. It was, it's, it's just right the way it was designed. Right, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and I remember talking to a friend of mine and I'm saying, this is what they say about the men. Like men often can't connect because they checked out at that early stage. They they aren't able to connect with their emotions. And I was, and they, they sometimes say it's because of, you know, the initial circumcision and a friend of mine, she's like, Oh, Oh. And she was very, cause her husband was, it was, it was very hard to connect with them emotionally. And she really feels that that, that was exactly why. Yeah, it could be. I mean, mo emotions are so complex that, you know, it's, it's, but it, it certainly doesn't help. And uh, oftentimes uh, we'll hear, oh, the baby just slept through it. And the circumcision went fine, the baby just slept through it. Well, what really happens is the baby's gone into shock. Right. And so there's a dissociation from his body. I mean, he's just absolutely withdrawn away from his own sense of himself. Right. That's, it's this extreme distress. The response to extreme distress is dissociation. And the baby is just, he's silent, not because you know, he stopped, he screams at first and then gives up on screaming and just goes into full dissociation and so why wouldn't you expect that to have long-term effects i mean any trauma any trauma in childhood is going to you're the, the person's going to carry it for the rest of their life absolutely and that's what i was talking to so so my husband so i have a son and i have a husband my son is intact my husband is not and i know he wouldn't mind me talking about this he's very open about everything but as wonder, as, as I'm wondering about, because he's done a ton of work on his own self-development, he just tries to be a little bit better than the day before. And that's what he does. He's a coach. He works with people and their traumas. But I said to him today, I said, I wonder if you were to go down that path, what if there's like, it's your body's going to know like that, that trauma is in your being. And I'm just wondering what would come up with, because that's something that he's, he's had other things that he's had to work through, but that isn't something. So I'm wondering, it would be interesting to see if he were to, somehow find a process to work through that trauma 
what would come up for him and how that would change him. And do you, do you know people that are, uh, did you do anything to work through that trauma or do you know of a program around that? <sighs> Do. I did go through something called, I think it was called rebirthing or something. It was a, a, a process where there was, um, they simulated the sound of the womb during birth with uh, uh, with a, a sort of rhythmic music and, uh, and deep breathing. And, uh, and of course, there was a, a guided, um, a leader guiding the, the, uh, mental trip back into early life and i wept i wept and wept and wept I, I wept so much that i didn't i was just in pieces and somebody actually had to take me home i, could, I couldn't even get home i mean it was like they were just saying you know this guy's in pieces and um i believe that's what i was connecting with i mean you know it was just really deep and was really real it wasn't something i was imagining and uh, yeah, so there are uh, there are therapies that help you get back. Uh, at the time, I'd also been going through psychoanalysis, and so I'd sort of gone way back into my early life already. And then I did this rebirthing thing, and it was like then it, then it really, really hit me. And I'd also uh, recently seen uh, on at the time uh, there was a documentary played on public television called. Uh, um, Oh gosh, I can't think of the name now. But it was a oh gosh. Mm. Anyway, it was a documentary done by a Canadian fellow about circumcision, and it played on uh, Independent Lens, I think, you know, on PBS in the United States. And it was uh, very uh, the first time I'd seen a circumcision, uh, a video of a circumcision. I think it was called "Whose Whose Body, Whose Choice, Whose Bodies, Whose Rights." I think was the name of the documentary. Anyway. Okay. Um, when I saw that, it just shocked me. And I thought, well, that, you know, I'm not looking at, that's me. I mean, I know that's what happened to me. And then it was like the empathy, this, the ability to connect to, well, this was just an image on the screen, but I immediately identified, yeah, that's, that's what happened. And, and it was uh, just, it's shocking to see a, a video of a circumcision. It's just, if you, it's just, it's just, uh, you can't believe people can be that brutal to babies. You just can't believe it, but they are. Do you feel that rebirthing process helped you? Did it change you? Did it heal you in any way? Well, it definitely, I mean, I worked through, I think it did because, uh, you know, it unblocked that memory and helped me to be more um, certain of my conviction that something has to be done to stop this practice mm -hmm. and um so uh, yeah i do believe it did help me and, and 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 the thing about uh you know grief and loss you if you have a loss you have to grieve yes. and grieve if it's in grief comes in stages from denial to anger to bargaining to depression to acceptance and you know this was the work of elizabeth kubler ross who was looking at cancer uh, people who had been diagnosed with cancer and how they grieved. And she saw this same pattern over and over again, but it's true for any grief. And it's, losing your foreskin, losing a body part, any kind of amputation, is it's a loss that you have to grieve. Mm -hmm. And most men are stuck in denial. There's the first stage of grief. They just want to deny it. And, uh, you know, the medical profession would, would be very happy to keep, keep these guys stuck in denial because, oh, yeah. you know, they're not suing them, which they should be. They should, should have their asses shoot, sued off. And does anybody ever get sued for that? Is that even a thing? The, there have been suits for wrongful circumcision where, the, where their consent wasn't valid. And some of those have been successful. And there, has, there was this... Uh, there have there have been suits that have been successful, and usually it's over botches, over or what they call defective consent. And I would like to suggest that all consent for infant circumcision is defective because it's surgery that's not necessary. So they have it's not ethical according to their own standards of medical ethics to do unnecessary surgery on an non-consenting minor, and because intact men never 
almost never choose to be cut. If you're going to do consent for someone, then you have to do it for what they would choose. You have to be choosing for them what they would choose for themselves. And we know they wouldn't choose it for themselves. So the consent is automatically invalid. The consent, the proxy consent that the parents uh, sign. And so, and also consent has to be informed. And it's not, a consent isn't just a piece of paper with a signature on it. It's an, a process of informing somebody of the harm and the risk and whatever benefits, which, you know, in the case of cutting out a tumor, there's a definite benefit, but if cutting off healthy body parts, there's no benefit. So there, nobody is being, parents are not being informed of the harm to their child. They wouldn't, they wouldn't sign the form if they said, you know, we're going to cut off part of your baby's penis for no good reason. And we're going to sell it for a, a hefty profit for us and just sign this form because you made this baby and we want to sell part of him. Please let us cut him into two. Would you do that for us, please? Nobody would sign it. No, of course not. So there's no valid consent. And so there's 100 million cut men in America and, and many more in Canada who have been subject to a mutilation and amputation with no reason and with no valid consent. So liability? Yeah, I think there's some liability there. There is. And that seems to be a big problem with the medical system, though. There's a lot of lack of informed consent and a lot of lack of liability, and it's becoming more and more apparent. Um, so a couple of things I just don't want to forget. So do you know of any programs that are helping men that have had that have issues that they know or something they want to heal with their circumcision? Do you know if there is something that they can reach out to? Right. Yeah, there's there's. Uh foreskin restoration uh, techniques, which is stretching the remaining for, foreskin uh, slowly so that the skin expands and eventually recovers the glands. And, and men who, it takes a long time, it takes years, but uh, men who do this consistently over the period of years are often successful in developing uh, something that looks like, a, almost like a natural foreskin. Of course, you don't regain this, the, the nerve endings that were lost, and you don't regain uh, the muscles that were lost, and you don't regain you know, the blood vessels that were lost, but you do regain something that uh, in, some, in many cases can, again, cover the glands as it's supposed to be covered. And men who've been successful at restoring their foreskin are usually very uh, glad that they did it. But some men try and are not successful, uh, because the damage that was done again is completely up to the to the to the perpetrator, the surgeon, to to, yeah. to decide how much damage they want to do. They can cut off the frenulum, which is the most one of the most sensitive part of the penis, if they want to. It's just up to us. We get to do it if we want to. You're just a helpless victim, and we can do what we want to you. So they some doctors don't cut as much skin, and so there's more to work with when they try to restore. Um, but when we explain foreskin restoration to people, sometimes we hear from usually mothers who are intent on cutting that, oh, well, he can just fix it later. We're going to cut him. Oh, Lord. And it's like, I, that's why I, I tend not to focus on restoration because I, my goal, our goal is primarily to pre prevent yeah. the damage in the first place. We don't want to enable anyone, give them one more enabling factor to let them do a stupid thing and uh, so but you know we often encounter men who are understand what we're talking about and are deeply saddened and we try to inform them about foreskin restoration there's a group called norm national organization of restoring men and they are uh, on the internet and there are various foreskin restoration devices there are uh, foreskin restoration group on reddit and uh, you know there's there are plenty there uh, from what i've heard is that over a hundred thousand foreskin restoration devices have been sold in america so really again when you come to the liability question this is such a good thing why have a hundred thousand people tried to reverse it what you know these guys are working for years to undo the damage that you wantonly done did to this the, them how again did you say this was a good thing yeah. so 
Yeah. And is there any kind of emotional support groups out there for them? I think Norm does do some of that. But, uh, you know, uh, self-help goes so far. Getting uh, professional help can be helpful, but some psychiatrists will will gaslight. Well, they'll make fun of you. They'll laugh at you. Oh, they'll wow. make you feel like they're you're the problem. How dare you complain? What's wrong with you? Be a man. You know, they're, they're, it's just, you're just, you really have to be careful if you go ask for professional help. It's just because you're paying them doesn't mean they're helping you. Right. So, um, you know, you got to find somebody who understands the problem. Uh, there's a psychologist in Boston called Ronald Goldman who wrote the book uh, Circumcision, the Hidden Trauma, who works with uh, uh, this on this topic. Uh, he's name, uh, Ronald Goldman, okay? Ronald Goldman, PhD, yeah. And he's a really sensitive, caring guy, and he totally understands the trauma of circumcision. He wrote a book about it. He's, and he also wrote a book for Jewish people called um, Questioning Circumcision, uh, A Jewish pers Perspective. So he, he's a Jewish guy. So um, it's important to reach out to different communities and from people that they trust. You know, they're not, they're not going to be that receptive to a message from an outsider, but um, Ronald Goldman can reach to them from as an insider. Right, right. Yeah, okay, that's good to know. So you mentioned using, they don't, they, what, what, do, what do they do with it once they remove it? This is uh, another outrage and you'd hardly believe it, but the foreskins are very valuable. They make a, uh, several products. Uh, they first of all, you can go onto uh, onto the internet and just buy infant fiber fibroblasts, which are the cells taken from a baby's foreskin. So stolen. This is organ theft, plain and simple. It's done in the open on in the U.S. Nobody's prosecuting. Oh my God! So you can buy you can buy infant fibroblasts. I think it's like three hundred and fifty dollars for a little vial of the things. Uh, to do Those, what? Huh? To do what Pardon? with? So they do scientific research. So they do that. So infants. Uh, so, but the the big money makers for the foreskin business is uh, they make cultured skin products. So they they separate the cells and they grow them on a culture until they get uh, a disc. It's, I think about three inches in diameter. And uh, they can make uh, you know thousands of these discs from one foreskin, and the discs sell for uh, hundreds of dollars each. So you know this is this foreskin is worth you know hundreds of thousands of dollars at least uh, when it's in when these products are made from it. So it's stolen tissue. The parents were were not informed that this would happen. They're openly. Uh, dealing in these uh this is human trafficking i mean this is living cells stolen from someone who didn't consent to the removal so it's human trafficking it's done in the open nobody's prosecuted what did they do with these cultured skin products they're used as uh, wound dressings and burn dressings and there are uh, there are artificial skin products that can do serve the same function i'm told um but uh, it's completely unethical to be stealing body parts for someone for somebody else's benefit. No matter what the benefit is for someone else, you don't steal somebody's body parts to benefit somebody else. That's not a justification. No, absolutely not. I mean, first the parents aren't informed as to the truth of the procedure itself. And then they go on to make hundreds of thousands of dollars from that little bit of skin that they took right. from the child. Like it, yeah. it's just- We're gonna sell part of your baby. The baby you had in your body for nine months and you yeah. cared for and you- carefully ate and exercised, ate the right diet and exercised and avoided smoking and coffee and did all the right things. Oh, we're gonna cut him into two and we're gonna sell part of him for our profit and uh, just sign this form. Why, why don't you, well, you mean you don't wanna sign the form? What's wrong with you? Right. I mean, <laughs> it's just madness. I also and the other thing- Oh, sorry, go ahead. One more thing that, yeah. that is, uh, there's, a, there's a skin cream for- Okay, that's what I was gonna expensive. ask. Sold to wealthy older women uh -huh. made from foreskin cells. Yes. It was promoted on the Oprah show by Oprah. She never apologized for this. 
Uh, it's been promoted by other uh, actresses, uh, media stars. And, uh, you know, somebody should be advising these people that you don't want your name attached to this. This is a crime against humanity. And you just put your name on it. And somebody should have told Oprah or someone should still tell Oprah, you know, you want to separate, you don't want, you want to say, I made a mistake when I thought that was a good idea. Uh, now that I know better, I'm uh, against it. And these uh, actresses who are promoting their careers by, um, I don't know how they're being rewarded. They're re I'm sure they're being rewarded some way for doing product promotions. Oh, for sure of course they are. All Product promotion is always rewarded. Of course. So they're getting something for it. We don't know what, but they should, somebody should be advising them that this is just, you don't want your name attached to this. This is like uh, endorsing the Holocaust or something. You just don't want, you don't want to say, oh, this is a good thing. No, that's like, don't do it. Don't go there. Well, Save I your think reputation. If, uh, mega rich celebrities and even Oprah, I'm just I'm questioning all of them and what's going on at that upper level. And it's like the ego is so, it's, it's so huge that they, they don't, it's, they just say it. Like they just say it knowing that nobody's going to touch them. Nobody's going to do it. It's, it's sick. Yeah, I think Ellen got into trouble. She, she, she was so, uh, she was, she mistreated her employees or something. And, and finally people said, you know, you've, 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 you've lost touch with reality, Ellen, uh, because, uh, you know, the, the story, you know, the, the, the image she wants to present is, is of a caring with it smart mm -hmm. person but you know apparently uh, because you know uh, power corrupt power tends to corrupt and if you if you're in a position where nobody's going to call you on anything you're you know you're probably going to get into trouble it's just yeah you know it just it happens people who are basically decent can go off the rails if nobody's saying well no 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 that's a mistake don't do that and not only that, we put them on a pedestal, no matter what they do, right? This yeah, is yeah. That's, that is a problem. Our kids are watching these these stars, and it's it's getting dark, in my opinion. But I don't want to digress into things. This is dark enough as it is. <laughs> yeah. um, it says one of your one of the billboards. I know that bloodstained man has says it destroys circumcision destroys sixteen plus functions. So right. can you share what some of those functions are? Right. So those functions are sexual, protective, and immunological. The one that people most understand, those are the broad categories. And right. the one people most understand is the sexual function, that if, if you're going to lose this gliding action, if you're going to lose most of the sensitivity in your penis, if the glands is going to dry out, if it's, uh, you know, th clearly that's going to have a negative impact on sex and uh, we know that it does mm -hmm. and you know uh, your partner will be deprived and you will be deprived and you know so that those are you, you know the, for uh, the american academy of pediatrics and other professionals who have promoted circumcision have consistently treated it as if there were no value to the foreskin, has no worth at all. There's no discussion of the value, the functions. And when you confront a, a doctor or a nurse who's trying to sell circumcision, just, oh, what, what are the foreskin? What are the functions of the foreskin? Could you please tell me? Mm -hmm. And they're just like, they don't know. They're just like, they're just like, what? They believe that has no function. <laughs> and that, you know, that enables them to do the terrible things they're doing. So, um, and the protective function, uh, Apparently, on the polar expeditions in the 19th century, they wouldn't take cut men because the foreskin is necessary to, to prevent frostbite huh. of the penis. Wow. Oh, I haven't heard that. Okay. Yeah. So it is, I mean, you know, anybody who's lived in a cold climate knows, you know, you don't, you want to stay warm. And that, you know, that's one thing that uh, the, the foreskin does. It also prevents in the in early life because it's fused together. It prevents uh, foreign matter from getting in there, and uh, that's uh, definitely uh, mm -hmm. a, a positive function. Mm -hmm. And then, what about the immunological? So uh, the foreskin uh, exudes um, 
I can't think of the name of it, but uh, uh, there, there are these Langerhan hand cells. I'm, I'm sort of, I don't remember this very accurately because it's kind of technical, but they have, they exude a substance that uh, has an immunological, forms an immunological barrier, which is, uh, protects um, from infection. And this latest paper that I just read out of Denmark said that uh, the cut men are having more infections than the uncut men. So just the opposite of what the sellers of uh, circumcision have been telling people that, uh, yeah, of course, you interfere with nature's work and you're going to be set, you're going to set yourself behind. If you could send me the link to that paper, that would be really great. I'd love sure. to post it in the notes. I will do. Yeah. Yeah, that would be really great. Yeah, it just came in today. I, I, oh, wow. Brand yeah. spanking new. And have there been other, so what, are, how many studies are there? Are there, is there a lot of, are there a lot of studies and peer reviewed articles and things like that around circumcision and lack of circumcision? Unfortunately, because the profit motive goes to doing circumcisions, most of the research is supporting the idea of doing circumcisions. And the most, uh, but, but there are, um, Morton Frisch in Denmark did a, a landmark study that showed that was a, uh, showed that the, un, uh, that painful sex was, was more prevalent uh, amongst the partners of cut men in Denmark than uncut men, which is not surprising, but it was the first time it was ever uh, put in the medical literature. And when he tried to publish this, there was, he met this tremendous resistance from people who were trying to prevent him from publishing it because they don't, they don't there's a story they don't want to hear. They don't want people to hear this. So uh, he had to fight, fight, fight to get his paper published. This was a few years ago. And anyway, so that was a landmark uh, case that, uh, that, demonst that revealed that uh, you have to talk, talking to sci scientists is like, you have to, it seems like so many times what's called science is just the most obvious thing in the world, but somehow you, it's like talking to a child. They have to be told the most obvious thing in the world. If you finally frame it in the language, they understand that, oh, oh, okay, I get it now. But uh, it's like, well, you, of, of, of course a whole, a whole penis is gonna work better than a partial penis. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know why we think we could ever improve upon nature's original plan. Uh, in yeah, so many how, ways, we're always are trying so to do yeah, I mean, they're just so deluded. And part of the problem was in, in America, the medical textbooks, when they would show a, a penis, they would show a circumcised penis. It was like anatomy was right amputated anatomy. So that was normalized to them. So they just like, and then they were, so many of them were cut when they were young that they just, they don't understand firsthand what, um, what, an, what, normal anatomy is and they, and they weren't even taught and the only thing they're taught about the foreskin is how to cut it off it's like they're just they're deluded they're indoctrinated into a, a mutilation culture it is and even in africa i mean the story around aids and hiv and a circumcised penis right, right. they were saying you're more susceptible to getting aids if you don't have a circumcised penis Actually, another paper that was I just saw today came from Ontario that showed that uh, there was no no reduction of HIV infection amongst uh, course. circumcised men in Canada. I, I can I can find that link too. Uh, yeah, volunteers. that'd be great. Yeah. Um, but in Africa, so people are highly motivated to vet, to defend circumcision because it's part of their cultural identity, uh, their tribal identity, or their religion, and the people who uh, did these studies in Africa uh, were biased. They, were, they, they had a reason to promote, to justify circumcision. And uh, it also, the, the work they did to justify circumcision was used by the American Academy of Pediatrics in America to say, yeah, we want to keep, keep paying us. We want to keep being paid for this because look at these studies in Africa. Mm -hmm. So these studies uh, relied on statistical trickery. So if you compare two very small numbers, 
the relative difference can be quite large. So it's like if you compare right. 0 0.001 to 0 0.002, the second category oh. is twice as big. Yeah. So you say it's twice as big. Right. And so that's what they did. They compared two very small numbers and they said, and this is repeated ad nauseum, circumcision reduces HIV by 60%. Well, not in the real world. Right. In America, when in the 80s and 90s, when so many young men were dying of AIDS, almost all of them were cut. Didn't help them. Mm. So that's that's the real world. It doesn't help. Mm -hmm. But anyway, they were motivated to promote circumcision in Africa and turned into a billion dollar industry. The Gates Foundation, the Clinton Foundation, <laughs> oh, UN AIDS, Clintons, of course, mm -hmm. the CDC all got on board this gravy train. Or, I mean, I, I don't understand Gates doing it because he was actually the one writing the checks. Why is he? I mean, it's not like he's profiting from this. He's actually could spend oh, his money better. he's profiting. Let's not make a mistake. There is a, let's, he's definitely profiting it somehow. That man, we won't even get into he, him. But. He's not stupid. He's not stupid, but it's, uh, you know, he should have been able to see through this. Yeah. And well, Warren Buffett, who is on the Gates Foundation board, is not stupid. And he should have said, no, we don't want our name associated with this. He should have. They haven't. Well, so his name is uh, associated with a lot of pretty questionable things. That that, yeah. So these people who are our, you know, our business geniuses yeah. have certainly fall, fallen down here. So we don't know what how they're compromised. That they they are somehow compromised. Anyway, there were four studies. We hear about three of them because three of them studied uh, the transmission of. HIV from women to men, and they uh, took HIV positive women with an HIV negative male partner, and they circumcised half the male partners, and then waited to see how many got HIV. But after they circumcised the partners, the the male the, the circumcised group uh, were had to with with taint, with with uh, abstain from sex for weeks while they healed. <laughs> So already there's a bias built in. They were given condoms. They were given education about safe sex. The other ones were just said, go have it, have it, do what you want. And so they found a very small difference in these three studies, which then they, they uh, exaggerated into 60% through a statistical trick that's well known in the, in the, in the business of uh, statistics. This is just trickery. So, yeah. but there was a fourth study. The fourth study studied the transmission from HIV positive women to HIV negative female partners. And in that study, they found that circumcision increased the transmission from females, males circumcision. to females. No, male circumcision increased oh, oh, okay. from HIV positive men to HIV, their HIV negative female oh, partners. Okay. Yeah. So what did they do with this information that made circumcision look bad? They buried it. They said, we're gonna cancel the study due to futility. I mean, that just gave away the cover story because if they really wanted to stop HIV, it's not futile to know that it, circumcision is making the matter worse. That's not futile. But if your only goal is to promote circumcision, well, then it is futile because it's not helping your goal. Right. So they gave away the game. They, they stopped this due to futility. Further, because most transmission is from male to female and not female to male, a small increase from male to female is going to have a bigger effect than a small decrease from female to male. So if you go around circumcising men, you're going to have more HIV because more women are going to get it. Yeah. And so, and the, you know, the Africa, you know, but, you know, it's billions of dollars have thrown at it and uh, they've, they've circumcised 25 million African American or African men and boys, sometimes by force, absolutely unethical. They've misled them. They've shamed, body shamed people, intact African men. They've treated African men just like animals, just like animals. This is supposed to be our enlightened uh, age where it's just shameful no and the money keeps pouring in from the u.s to do this it's criminal it's a crime against humanity absolutely a crime against humanity nothing is you never hear about it in the media nothing except to say oh circumcision prevents aids look at 60 percent reduction 
it just you never hear you never hear the reality right and i think they're a whole aid story that's a whole other rabbit hole but i i just they use it for their they, i mean obviously i mean it's they get the insurance money they sell it they it's just uh you can just see right through it but people don't want to know and they don't want to look so where in the world is it more common to not circumcise and keep them intact yeah most of europe is intact only you know in, in christians in uh europe or or non-religious people in europe also don't cut their voice and they said well we don't do that that's not part of our culture the only people doing it there are, are jews and muslims and a lot of european jews don't cut their voice just like you know some europe some american jews don't cut their voice you know if you once you get informed you think well i'm not gonna do that to my son this is just mm -hmm. a silly ritual screw that and so uh, south americans don't cut although the the aids uh fraud is being promoted to south americans now mm. i hope they are able to resist it but uh, uh, um, in asia non-muslim asian countries don't cut their boys uh, that's pretty much it Afri and well in africa it varies by uh culture some of them uh for traditional tribal reasons, cut their boys. Some don't, but because of this mass circumcision campaign, that's thrown everything mm. uh, into. Uh, it's it's disrupted the, the the pattern. But would you say that more of the world does not cut than cut? Yes. Yeah. More do not. More do not. More do Most not. men in the world are intact. This is good to know, and it's very interesting because the U.S. also has some of the worst neonatal survival rates in the developed world as well they are like way at the bottom in terms of those statistics so and it's such a medicalized procedure the whole birthing act in itself it's so medicalized that it, i mean that the the survival rates of our babies in in north america are is, is the, the records way worse than in much so we say less I don't know, less industrialized. Less advantaged countries, yeah. yeah. I mean, we're we're spending more for medicine, getting worse results. Absolutely. And uh, also, if you compare by states, the states that do the most circumcision also have a higher, tend to have a higher mortality, infant mortality rate. Mm. So, which makes perfect sense. You're doing unnecessary surgery. Of course, there's going to be some complications, oh. of course. Of course, it's going to affect your numbers. Absolutely. So, Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's uh, it's just such a tragedy that, and getting the word out there is essential. And I'm somebody who actually believes I want to have faith in institutions. I mean, I really do want to trust institutions. I'm not somebody who wants to say to tear down the system. I, I really, but these institutions have not earned our trust. They no, they're they operating not. without any uh, responsibility to the people they're supposed to be serving. So it's it's again power corrupting. They've they've not been held to account. They have to be held to account. Mm -hmm. In America, the way you do it is you sue people. They need to be they need to face big lawsuits in order. So until they're losing money, they don't they won't they won't start caring. Right. Right. So what is your message to parents, say, if they were really considering, oh, no, like what one thing that I hate is the story of, well, he can't look different than his dad. It's like, when does a son and father stand side by side and compare penises? Like that is such a ridiculous argument for it. Like I, I've got it in my house right now and I'm telling you, it has never once come up ever. <laughs> like it's just it's, such a silly it's argument. It's insane. It's so, insane. Another study out of Canada said that the, the most, the, the best predictor for whether a boy will be cut is whether his father was cut. So that's, um, there's that bit of data. But if you think about what the way they, the, the point, the way circum, the people who are trying to sell circumcision will look for any way they can do it. And one way is to uh, capitalize or subvert or pervert natural impulses and one natural impulse is for a father to want his child to look like him because before genetic testing that was the indication that he was the real father right mm. 
Mm. So, you know, if you say to a potential dad, but you want him to look like you, don't you? It means one thing that, yeah, of course, I'm, I want to be, I, 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 I want to be to, my actual paternity to be acknowledged and to be, you know, to be a, a reality. Right. And so they, they uh, subvert and pervert that natural impulse and say, would you, you, you want him to look like you, don't you? And so then he said, oh, yeah, I do. And then, oh, so we'll cut him to match you. Mm. And so it's, it's uh, they're very devious, very sick. But uh, and that's one factor. The other factor is there are sometimes doctors who don't want to cut, but the father is adamant to cut. And it's called adamant father syndrome. Yeah. And in that case, um, what's happening is that he's stuck, he's, his phase of grief is stuck in denial. He has to deny that he, he was harmed. He absolutely, it's essential for his well-being to deny that he was harmed. And if he allows his son to go up, to, to not be harmed, then he has to acknowledge that he was harmed. Mm. And so there's, so that's a, another problem with you. And, and some marriages have ended over this or have been, some wives have just said, you know, you're not going to cut my boy, period. And if you want to leave, if, if that's your, if that's your thing, you can want, you know, you can go because I, right. I, he's my boy, as much as your boy, and he's not going to be cut, period. Right. I took nine months to build this boy, and you're not going to wreck him, no matter what your stupid psychological needs are. Right. If that's your problem, get out. Yeah. And sometimes the marriage falls apart, but usually what happens is the, the husband says, well, well, gee, you know, okay, have it your way. I guess, I guess you're right. Right. But it's crazy how adamant some people are. They, it, they just won't even go there and it's just not rational to yeah, really not. explore it. Right. This is completely irrational. So what would you, what is your message to parents that might be listening to this or to parents to be that might be listening to this and they were going to go down that path because they just didn't think anything of it. You know, the title of your podcast is sovereignty. And I think people sometimes believe that it's my boy. I can do whatever I want. to. I'm sovereign here. Mm. And I think thinking about, or you have to realize this is another person and they have sovereignty over their own life. And you can't, it's, 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 um, it's, in, uh, it's a big mistake to force your values on somebody else like that. And they, when slavery was on its way out, the slave owners said, I have a property right in my slaves. You can't end slavery because I have a fundamental property right, which you're denying me. You're denying me a basic human right, the right to have property, if you take my slaves away from me. And that argument held until people said, but wait a minute, these enslaved people are humans. They're not animals, they're humans, mm -hmm. and they have their own rights. And if we look at their rights, then you have no right to take away their rights. And in the same way, you have no right to take away your child's right to decide about his own body if he wants to alter it in some way. It's his decision, it's his body. He is not your little slave. He is not your property. He is not a thing for you to cut up as you wish. He's a separate human being, a new life, a new chance to make a better world. And he has to be given his own chance in life to grow up whole and healthy and happy and untraumatized Mm. and to bring that into the world and let him make the world whatever he can do with it that's your job as a parent it's not to make the world bad forever it's to let the world get better by bringing in new life that can heal and rejuvenate and make the world a better place treating a child like property is absolutely wrong absolutely wrong and and until people get it it's just got to sink into your head this is a new life you don't own him he's your boy but he's not your property thank you oh dear yeah 
Yeah, it makes That's me cry too. <laughs> oh yeah, that I, I that was very powerful. Thank you. That that is a very important message for every parent to hear, and it's going to be hard for parents who's who has done this to hear it. Right. But they need to hear it. And maybe you thought you did the best thing with what you knew at the time, but. Yeah, we deal with regret parents too, and some of them join our protests. And, you know, we, we have to be very gentle with them because they were misled. Yeah. And if, if they had known the truth, they wouldn't have done what they did. And so a lot of them are really beating themselves up and, and really, really going through a lot of trauma. And you just have to say, the fault was in the people who misled you. You should have been told the truth. And it's, it's too bad you, you, you fell for the lie, but, you know, and at, when they join our protests, they are very vocal and very helpful. And it's important for the regret moms to be talking to potential mothers to say, you know, you don't wanna do this. You don't wanna feel this way. You don't want to have to apologize to your son when he grows up and says, well, why did you come up part of my body? What, what were you thinking? So it's, it's and, and always, always, always regret parents need to be treated um, carefully and, and, you know, find the compassion because, you know, you can't blame them for, you know, being misled. Right. Oh, wow. And you guys make quite a statement as well when you are protesting, right? All dressed in white with a big blood stain right in the crotch area. It's a pretty powerful visual to see that. So if somebody wants to get involved with blood stain, are you just in the United States, the association? Uh, we've done a protest in uh, Vancouver once. And we actually, before the pandemic came, we were going to do a Northern Great Plains protest, which would go into Canada. Um, but then, you know, every travel stopped and, uh, yeah. we, you know, it, that all stopped. So when travel resumes, I hope we can do that, that Northern Great Plains uh, protest again and reach into the Canadian provinces where the need is the greatest, which is the Midwestern ones. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the protests in, in Vancouver were great. We got some media attention there and we, uh, uh, we had, you know, it was really awesome it was awesome you know we, we you know we were glad we were able to do it and uh we, so we, we would love to go back to canada again nice you know. and so people can just find it's bloodstainedmen.com is that what it is that's right bloodstainedmen.com one word uh we have just redone our website recently and we've got uh there's a lot of drilling down you can do you can find current events our upcoming event is is through this throughout the state of Pennsylvania with a, a foray into New York, uh, but uh, in, into Buffalo, New York, but throughout Pennsylvania, that's coming out, that's starting in a couple of, in uh, on the 29th. So in uh, two days, it's starting mm -hmm. and we'll be all over Pennsylvania. The, the, the schedule is on our website. Uh, and if you're in Pennsylvania or nearby and want to join, we'd, we'd love to have you. Uh, we have lots of uh, papers, scientific papers and uh, other stuff on our website that, that are helpful for uh, people who are really want to research uh, the topic and uh, and we have links to other websites that are very very helpful uh, one one that just showed up is called circumcision is a fraud.com and it's it explains very clearly why it's uh, illegal and fraudulent to circumcise baby boys it's uh, done by lawyers they know what they're talking about it's uh, they make a very strong case mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, we're very proud of our website. Just redid it, and we're very proud of it. We hope people will see it as a resource and and can launch off to other great websites. And and you know, it's there's a lot of information out there. If you get past the the disinformation machine, you can find that. Uh, yeah, of course, nature didn't make a mistake. Yeah, that's obvious. Should be obvious to everyone. And it's you know, it's like your intuition was probably right when you thought that nature was <laughs> did the right thing. And, uh, you know, you're so we're very proud of the website and we'd, we'd love to have visitors come and join and we'd love to have people show up in Pennsylvania in the next two weeks while we're out there. And how are just lastly around like the the protests, how are they received by the public? Are people shocked? Are they open? Are they disgusted? Are they curious? What, what do you get? All of the above. We get <laughs> anger. 
resentment. Sometimes people throw things at us. Sometimes they're Sometimes they're giving us a big thumbs up and say, thank you, thank you, thank you. And sometimes people stop and say, you know, we saw you here two years ago and we didn't cut our son because we saw you and we, we understood right away that this is a terrible thing to do. And yeah, it's like, it makes me cry because that's, that's the whole idea and, and it works. And we're fighting against a, a system that, that wants to sell, sell, sell mutilation. And, and, but, you know, getting out on the streets, talking to people face to face, Putting our bodies on the line, you know, it's it's um, it's hard work, but you know, it's really um, rewarding in that you you meet, you know, I, I, online discussions can be very hateful and nasty and brutish and awful, but when you meet people face to face, usually it's much better. Yeah. And sometimes people come to counter protest, and we talk to them, and about half the time they get it and they walk away enlightened. I mean, they say, "Oh, you know, you guys are right." Wow. And not always, but you know, it's like the truth is amazingly powerful. <laughs> it's, it's like it really works. Right. Right. Well, this is it's such important work. I'm so thankful that I found I actually I was my through my last interview with Amanda Volmer, I'd heard about Brother K. So then I looked him up and then I looked up in and connected. And I'm so glad I did because it's such an important mes message. And I really feel there's a lack of advocacy for our children. We need the ad they when they can't advocate for themselves, it's our it's our responsibility to do yeah. that. We have to. I mean, we they need us. They're depending on us. Right. This is such an important thing that you just you can't really undo. Where you might there might be these machines sold and there might be some, but you can't undo something like that and then the, the physical trauma the emotional trauma everything it's on top yeah. of that. it's just and you and you don't know what you what you don't know as a man who has lived his whole life that way you don't you don't know what it would have been like otherwise and that's a real disservice to our boys yeah yeah so Thank you, Harry. I, I think we've covered it all. Unless there's anything else you wanted to mention, I really appreciate your time today. It's, it's very heartfelt <laughs> and uh, an important mission and cause. It's been a real pleasure talking to you, Sasha. Thank you so much for giving me, giving me a chance to talk to you. Mm, thank you. I know the audience is going to appreciate it. So mamas, papas, if you have children and you've done this, I mean, it's not about the guilt, it's about the knowing and the information. And if you are about to have children, then please think about it. As Harry says, yes, you are sovereign over your own body. And this is a big issue that we're fighting with right now, these days, currently. And to take that away from your children is not your right, right? Our, our job and our responsibility is to protect them at all costs, is to be there and to take care. And if you've listened to this at all, you know that there is harm being done and no benefit. It's all harm, no benefit. And it's, it's really a monstrous practice that needs to stop. So it stops with you and it with each and every one of us. So please, and please share if you feel that this could help anyone, if you know someone who is about to have a boy, and they are going to go down that path, and this might change and might save one more boy. So please, if you can share, please do. And thank you for tuning in until the next time. Thanks, guys.